Yeah, you know, Casey preached, thank you. Casey preached last week and he talked about how Jesus is the, the better friend, right? And so God in his grace to me has given me Casey and, and Pastor John and, and some others here in the church to be that friend to me, to walk alongside me and help me to grow in my faith. And so uh, incredibly honored and privileged to be up here this morning. Um, yeah, it is an honor and a privilege to bring God's word and his message today. Uh, before I do that, though, I want to just touch on Love Del Rey yesterday. Anybody participate in Love Del Rey yesterday? We had our third quarterly Love Del Rey. Absolutely. We didn't give a big round of applause. We had, I think, somewhere around 150 people show up from six or eight different congregations. We partnered with the Rotary Club. We partnered with other organizations in the city, like the Delray Beach Children's Garden. We did Beach Cleanup, the Miracle League of Delray Beach. And some people, I found out this morning, were actually at their location serving till 7 o'clock last night is when they finished the job. And so that was from 8 in the morning to 7 at night. And so we um, certainly have a faithful presence in this city. And so I want to remind us of what our mission and vision is here at the church, right? We're bringing the renewing beauty of Jesus to brokenness. And we're doing that in real tangible ways to our city. And uh, it's through faithful presence and it's through collaboration is a couple of our outcomes on our strategic framework. And so... um, Yesterday was monumental. You can turn it to the mission and the vision if you would. And uh, I just want to remind you of that, of what God has called us to here at the church. And he is doing these things through us. And so be excited for what God is doing. Um, Our strategic framework, as we look at that, like I talked about, the collaboration and the faithful presence is what's happening in our city. But we also have outcomes like disciples, leaders, uh, and family, right? And so I am a perfect example of how the Avenue Church has transformed and changed an individual in our community, right? People have poured into me in the last 10 years. Casey whispered in my ear down there. He's like, man, this is crazy. Like 10, 11 years ago, you were in jail. I said, that's right. I was, right? About 11 years ago, I was in jail. And so God does miracles for sure. And so today we're going to fixate on just a couple concepts, three of them to be exact. We're going to kind of camp out on God's anointing of his people. We're going to talk about God's anointing of his people. Throughout scripture, God has anointed specific people and he's called them by name. And he has called you by name if you're here and you've put your faith and trust in Christ. And so we want to talk about God's anointing. We're also going to talk about God's promises this morning. How they're being fulfilled throughout all of scripture. God is fulfilling his promises. He's fulfilling them through you and I. And I'm going to give you some examples of that. God's presence, right? God is here with us. We're going to examine how God's presence empowers us for mission, to go into the city, to do things, to go to Haiti, to bring the renewing beauty of Jesus to brokenness, right? God does that through his presence. Do you know that God is with us now, right? God is here present in this auditorium. He is with us. He's with us always. He goes before us. His spirit dwells within us for those that have been called uh, by name and have trusted in his finished work on the cross. And so don't miss that, right? Don't miss that. If you take one thing away from today, take away that God is with you. His presence is always with you. Dallas Willard, one of my favorite theologians and pastors, he's passed away now, But he said the first thing he did every morning when he got up is he reminded himself of God's presence. Immediately, that was the first thought that came into his mind every day is God is with here, with me right here, right now. He is for me, right? And if we live with that type of mentality, I promise you, your life will change in really sweet and amazing ways. But we forget this. We're quick to forget God's presence in our lives. Last week, I had this beautiful reminder of God's presence. And it happened between myself and three specific people in this congregation. God, in his love for me, revealed his transformative grace in three other people to me last week here in this congregation that overwhelmed me with joy. See, God is in the business of redemption and renewal. And he's redeeming all of us that have been called according to his purpose right, who have put our trust and faith in him. But I've seen and I witness really incredible transformative grace in specific people at specific times, right? And so these three people last week blew my mind, right? As they came in, I saw just beauty. God is the God who brings beauty from ashes. Last week, these three people looked completely 
different than the first time that I met them, that they walked through our doors and became part of our congregation. I know some of the backstory of these three people. They've shared it with me. They've confided in me. And so I know some of the pain that they brought in here with them, the suffering that they brought in with them. I think I would describe them in some words like angry, despaired, lonely, hopeless, or certainly lacking hope, and downcast or sad. These are the words that I would have described them. Some of them I met a few months ago. One I met over a year ago that has slowly been coming to the church. They came to the Avenue Church with pain and sorrows that affected them in really significant ways. And it was obvious. I tend to always be moving real fast before service. So if anybody's seen me here, I'm running around, I'm doing this, I'm doing that. And so I can miss these things sometimes Sunday mornings, but the Lord wouldn't let me miss this. He slowed me down to see all three of them in beautiful clarity, and I'm so thankful. He helped me to really behold his glory in seeing the transformation in these three individuals' lives. I was absolutely floored with the radiance in which they shined. I saw a complete physical, emotional, and spiritual transformation that's happened in these three people. See, God has chosen these three people. He's anointed them. He's called them by name. He's doing something beautiful in their lives, and it's obvious to those that are around them. I would describe them last week as smiling, glowing, joyful, hopeful, radiant, as I said. This is radical gospel renewal. It's happening all over here at the Avenue Church. Don't miss it, ladies and gentlemen. God is radically bringing his transformative grace to us. And it's happening through his spirit and it's happening through one another. And I can say, uh, I know for a fact that these three individuals that I'm talking about, it's happening through other people. It's happening from the anointing of his spirit upon them, but it's happening because people in our church have chosen to love them well, to enter into their world, apply the gospel to them, and then point them to their only hope in Jesus, right? And it's just not happening on Sunday. It's happening throughout the week. And some of you are probably thinking, who are these individuals, right? But I bet some of you have already got a picture of your head who they may be. Right? I just glanced out and saw one of them. I'm not going to say their names, but one of them I told I would bring into the... One of them knows that I was going to speak about it. The other two don't even know. But the truth is, we all know people like this in the midst of our congregation, right? They may be sitting next to you. They probably are sitting next to you. From a spiritual standpoint, every one of us are miracles like that. God is transforming us by the power of his spirit. So just recently... I got to travel home. So I went back to Lake Mills, Iowa. Anybody ever heard of Lake Mills, Iowa? Besides my parents that are sitting in front row. Oh, boy, Chris, all right. So Lake Mills, Iowa is a really small town in north central Iowa. It was where I was raised. It's where I grew up. It's about 1,800 people. I graduated with about 46 kids. And it was for a very sad reason. Uh, My cousin had passed away. She died what we think is an overdose. We're pretty sure it's an overdose. She struggled with prescribed medications for many years. And um, it fold ultimately took her life. Um, Incredibly tragic and sad, for sure. Um, But when I heard she passed, uh, almost immediately I felt like the Spirit say, you you need to go. You need to go and you need to officiate that funeral. As hard as it's going to be, you need to enter into that pain and that brokenness and that sorrow and give them hope, right? Because outside of Christ, we really don't have a whole lot of hope. But I can bring the greatest hope in the entire world in Christ, home there. And I did. And I had the honor and the privilege of doing that. So I traveled back to Lake Mills, Iowa. The fact that I even entered into that brokenness is a miracle in and of itself, for sure. I left there almost 18 years ago, and uh, I had so many fond memories of growing up, family and friends. And as I traveled back that day, it was a Sunday morning, actually, I just remember the memories were flooding through my mind of family, friends, craziness, um, I actually had butterflies driving into town, which is awesome. I thought, just excited to be back here 18 years later. Um, Let me just give you a quick overview, though, of the last eight years of my life in Lake Mills, Iowa. Mind you, right, I'm going to officiate a funeral, and I'm going to give you a little bit of a taste of who I was those last eight years. And so I'd been ticketed multiple times for things like open container, um, underage drinking, and uh, my favorite one is public urination. That, 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 that's a good one, right? Yeah, I'm, I'm super proud of that one. 
super proud. But the reason I bring that up is because that's not who I am anymore, right? I can laugh about it today. We can laugh about it. God has radically transformed me, and um, I no longer get public urination tickets. Can you believe it? <laughs> Unbelievable. Yeah, praise God for that. Praise God. I remember I walked into, I went to a local community college and I walked into my humanities class after that weekend or maybe it was a weekend after. They publish all those things in the, the local paper back home as they kind of do here. And uh, Mr. Groniga, my humanities teacher in my freshman year of college humanities class, laminated it and blew it up and handed it to me in front of the whole class, right? Yeah, embarrassing. Somebody who already is incredibly insecure and fearful had to come up to the front of the class and receive this from me. I look back and laugh. It's the same guy that actually nominated me to drive in the presidential motorcade. So I don't know what his bearing was or what he was thinking, but the same guy actually nominated me to drive in the, the uh, President Clinton's motorcade when he came, which is really strange uh, when I think about it. His judge of character is not great. Not great. Um, so my mom is here today, I mentioned. My mom is sitting in front row, and he uh, must be proud. Right? You must be really proud. Oh, man. Um, sorry. Love you. But I, I'll tell you, she's as thankful as anybody, right, that the Lord has redeemed me. Right? She, she spent many, many tireless nights praying for me, for sure. And so, um, yeah, I'm just thankful for her. Many sleepless nights. I was telling her when I was home for the funeral, uh, me and my sister were in the room and we we're sitting in the hotel room and I was telling her all of our escapades and all the craziness and just how much partying we did back then. And she's like, just, I don't want to hear it. I really don't want to hear it. She says, when we moved out of our old house, I found adult magazines and I found beer bottles everywhere. She's like, I just don't want to hear it. She's like, I don't know what you guys did in that basement, but uh, it wasn't good. I was not a golden child, right? I certainly wasn't a golden child. I wasn't raised in the church. Uh, but I do want to say, Mom, I love you, and I want to thank you for just being faithful and, and uh, just loving us so well over the years. And um, I'm really appreciative for your presence in my life and for your willingness to just continue to, to fight along with me as I continue to battle this, um, never giving up hope in me. I would like to say, though, for the record, just for the record, that I was a decent wrestler and football player, and so I was an athlete. Somehow I did both. My alcohol hadn't got out of complete control at that point, and so I was able to finish school, finish college, go to state and wrestling, do some things. And so, uh, but the weekends were debauchery, were craziness. And uh, I'm certainly not proud of all these things, but they are the truth, right? I want to bring the truth out. They're part of who I was. And if I'm going to be 100% truthful, I had a lot of good times. I can look back and say some of those were really good times, and I enjoyed them. By God's grace, though, I'm celebrating 10 years of sobriety this month because the Lord has redeemed and ransomed. Yeah. <clears throat> God loved me too much to leave me where I was at, right? Because my drinking and my drugging got out of control. I was arrested here, like he said, in, in uh, July of 2007 here in Delray Beach, actually. And so the Lord loved me way too much to leave me where I was at. And actually, a beautiful thing here this morning, I just want to touch my sponsor, who, when I first got sober, who introduced me to the Lord, who I have not seen in years, is sitting in this auditorium today. Yeah, how cool is that? John, I got to see John this morning before I went out, and he, got to, he prayed for me. He introduced me to the Lord and uh, brought me through my 12 steps, and I found freedom uh, in and through Jesus while walking alongside this man. And so, John, I'm incredibly thankful for you, for sure. I thank God. So you can imagine, right? I'm going back to Lake Mills, Iowa to deliver this message, to officiate a funeral, and this is my past, right? I'm going back and people are already talking. Anybody here from a small town, you know about chatter and gossip, right? I don't know how it got out, but it got out right away that Mitch was coming back and he's going to give this, he's going to officiate this funeral. And so um, one of the texts from one of the girls that was helping out uh, arrange the funeral was <laughs> that. Mitch? Dot, 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 question mark. <laughs> right? One of my former teachers called somebody at the funeral and they said, there is no way, it, it has to be a coincidence that Mitch Thompson is officiating. This is one of my teachers, right? And so it, it was an honor and a privilege and um, I got to go. 
uh, back to my high school. Me and my sister actually got to go back to my high school, and we got to visit classrooms and see the wrestling room, and I got to see my football coach, my wrestling coach, and we had this really cool little short conversation. He said, you know, I just Googled you. I heard what was going on in your life, and I'm super happy for what's going on in your life. Mr. Burns just encouraged me for a moment of what God is doing in my life. I don't know where he stands with the Lord, but I'm certain that it had an impact on him because he knew uh, my craziness. Um, And so, you know, it is God's anointing on my life. It's the fact that he's called me, he's chosen me, he's set apart for good works, and part of that is being here this morning and teaching. He's also, his promises are obviously coming true in my life, right? And that's not to boast in me, that's to boast in Christ, right? What Christ has done in me, his promises are certainly coming true. In fact, in Jesus, all of his promises are yes and amen, is what the scriptures say. This is Jesus, the promise keeper's impact on my life. He is the promise keeper. And his presence has continued to be with me, obviously. It always is. And propelled me through ministry. Being a pastor here uh, has been a crazy ride in and of itself. That's a story for another day. But uh, that day, I got to deliver at that funeral. I got to articulate the gospel. To a ton of brokenness, to a ton of pain, I got to articulate the full gospel, the good and the bad news of Christ. The only hope that we have in this world, right? And so that was beautiful. But you know what I think made a bigger impact than even giving the gospel, articulating the gospel, is my life. The fact that I was standing before these individuals proclaiming the gospel, seeing a transformed man, that has impact, right? And so don't ever doubt the impact that you have on others uh, because of what Christ has done in you. And so I've been anointed. I've been entered into. God has ushered me into his grand narrative, right? This story of scripture. He's brought me into it as he's brought you if you've been called, right? He has rewritten my story and he's rewriting your stories as well. In his presence in my life through the Holy Spirit, God has done these amazing things. And as I mentioned, it's through the community of believers. It's through people like Casey and John and uh, my DNA group that meets regularly. And so I'm, I'm seriously honored to be here. And it's only because people's commitment, it's God's presence in my life through his spirit and through his people that have transformed me. And so today we're landing still. We're in Connected, a new way to live. And so we're going to jump in and we're going to tie some scripture verses back to Jesus. We're looking at how everything points back to Jesus, right? It says in Luke 24, 44, that all things which are written about me in the law of Moses and the prophets and the Psalms must be fulfilled. A couple weeks ago, Jesus, Casey reminded us that Jesus is the better king, right? And then Sam reminded us that Jesus is the better David. And then Casey came back and reminded us that Jesus is the better friend, See, the Avenue Kids, we're paralleling our sermon series with, with what our Avenue Kids are going through. So right now, our children, our kids, and the Avenue Kids are learning the same thing we are. They're in 2 Samuel 7. They're learning about the Davidic Covenant, the same thing I'm going to teach about. And they have incredible um, curriculum that comes from Lifeway, the Gospel Project. Every single week, there's a Christ connection. It points what they're studying, and they're in the Old Testament right now, to Jesus, right? Everything points to Jesus, Everything culminates in Jesus. And so we don't want you guys to miss that. And so that's why we're doing this series. We want to show you how everything points to Jesus and how everything hinges upon him. What we're doing is helping you to see that God has ushered you into his story. It's all about God and his plan to redeem and restore. It's not about us. Although he does, in his grace to us, allow us to take part in his story and his redemption and renewal. In fact, it says in Ephesians 2.10 that we are created, each of us, in his very image to accomplish his will for our lives and others. We are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. How do we connect all of life to God's grand narrative? To look through the biblical lenses, the scriptures, to look through them to interpret your current situation and circumstances with what the Bible has to say. See, the Bible has a lot to say about God, right? The character of God, and that has a huge impact on you, and it has a lot to say about us because of what Jesus has done for us. That has to impact every part of our lives. Nothing is more important than living this out in your everyday lives, is to understand how you are entered into God's narrative. What does God's narrative have to say about your failing marriage? 
or your wayward son or daughter, your addiction, depression, anxiousness, fear, it speaks into all of them, right? Every bit of it, the scriptures speak into. For those who have placed their trust and faith in Christ, he is using every single second of our lives for his purpose. He says for our good and his glory, actually. His promises are true no matter your circumstances. No matter what you're going through, his promises are true. And we got to learn to trust those. I found on the internet anywhere from 3,000 to like 7,000 promises in scripture. That is crazy. All of them are yes and amen in Jesus. Right? These are promises God made to his people in scripture. Nothing is ever wasted in God's economy. In the midst of suffering and pain, the enemy wants you to think that God has abandoned you, that he's no longer with you, right? But as we just talked about, God is always with us. We need to be reminded God is with us. And if we can't remember that, we need people around us to remind us that God is with us. God is for us. He's placed his spirit within us to help and encourage people as they're walking through pain and suffering, right? Because pain and suffering is real, right? We all go through it. This is precisely why we need to know God's character, How do we know his character? By reading his word, right? By jumping into the scriptures. We have to be reading our scriptures, ladies and gentlemen. See, God cares deeply about our pain and our suffering. He cares deeply about our lives. We're made in his very image. He hates the brokenness of this world. That was not part of his original plan, right? But it is part of our reality because of the fall, because of what Adam and Eve chose. I'll go into that a little bit later, but he didn't choose that. It was chosen. We enter into that. We've inherited that sin nature. The brokenness of the world crushes God. He hates it too, right? And so don't lose sight of that. Be mad at the sin and suffering of this world, but don't be mad at God, right? God wants to enter in and walk you through them. If you want to turn your Bibles now, we're going to be in 2 Samuel 7. We'll camp out there for the remainder of our time. But before we go there, I want to bring out just a couple important details about David that will further help us point uh, him to Jesus. In 1 Samuel 16, David is shown to be God's chosen one. God calls and anoints David to be the king of Israel. The Old Testament language for anointed was Messiah. The Hebrew word for Messiah is Messiah, which means the anointed one. Israel desired a righteous king to save them, and this is where this term comes from. God delivered. He gave them a righteous king. God is the anointed David to be their Messiah. This was a very common theme throughout 1 Samuel and 2 Samuel. If you go back and read that this week, I encourage you to do that. Let me quickly remind you who David was. Right? We've been talking about David for two or three weeks. David was the smallest and the youngest of Jesse's sons, right? God told Samuel that his anointed one would come through Jesse's line. And so Samuel went to Jesse's house expecting to find the next king. And Jesse brings out seven of his brothers, right? Parades each one of them singly by themselves in front of Samuel thinking it's got to be the firstborn. It's always the firstborn. No, it's not the first. It's not the second. It's not the third, right? He parades all of them in front of God, in front of Samuel. And Samuel, the Lord's telling Samuel, that's not it. That's not it. Samuel says, you have another son, right? He says, yes, I have one more. He's just a little guy. He's out in the field. He's a shepherd. Called in David. He says, this is my anointed one, right? God placed his anointing upon David. The one that who wasn't even invited in. Can you imagine? Right? The God of the universe sends a prophet to your home. That he's going to anoint one of you. And you don't even get invited to that party. <laughs> Right? I mean, that's pretty sad. David didn't even get invited in. His dad didn't think there was any way it could have been David. But see, God sees the heart, right? God chooses, God calls. He knew his plans for David, and he chose him by name as he chooses us by name, right? Apostle Paul reminds us of this concept in his letter to the Corinthian church. God chose what is foolish in the world to shame the wise. God chose what is weak in the world to shame the strong. God chose what is low and despised in the world, even things that are not, to bring to thing, nothing things that, to bring to nothing things that are. Right? And so God chooses us. He chooses broken sinners like me, right? Because it brings him incredible glory, right? He chooses us and calls us. How is God using you? 
What has God called you to? Right? If we knew what God had called us to or what God's calling us to, our lives would look differently. If we knew what he's capable of doing in our lives, but I think we underestimate what God can do. Actually, I know we do. We have no idea what he can do. The God of the universe wants to use us mightily, right? And as we lean into that, as we trust in Jesus and his anointing on us through his spirit, I would encourage you to lean into that calling, right? God anoints David. Later, he anoints Jesus. And finally, he anoints us. We're going to talk about anointing just for a second. Another meaning for the word anointed, like I said, is chosen one. The Bible said that Jesus Christ was appointed and anointed by God with the Holy Spirit to spread the good news and free those who have been held captive by sin, that is us. After Christ left the earth, he gave us the gift of the Holy Spirit. Now we are the anointed ones, right? We are the fulfillment of that Old Testament anointing. We all are anointed that have chosen God as our Savior, that put our trust and faith in him. We are now anointed with his very spirit. His spirit dwells within us. So we're going to pick it up now, and we're going to see how all of life points to Jesus. And we're going to look at it through the lens of 2 Samuel 7. At this point, David has been anointed to the king of Israel. He has taken this anointing. He's actually been taken in as king. He's fought battles. He's won battles. In fact, it says he beat and defeated the Jebusites and taken over the city of Jerusalem, which he called the city of David. The Ark of the Covenant was brought into the city of David. The very presence of God. The Ark of the Covenant was the very presence of the God. And I'll go into that a little bit more, but it was brought into the city of Jerusalem. Right? They had peace. And so a couple things here as we jump in. Um, if you've got your Bibles open, we're going to read in 2 Samuel 7, verses 1 through 9 right now. Now when the king lived in his house, and the Lord has given, had given him rest from all his surrounding enemies, the king said to Nathan the prophet, See now, I dwell in a house of cedar, but the ark of God dwells in a tent. And Nathan said to the king, Go, do all that is in your heart, for the Lord is with you. But that same night, the word of the Lord came to Nathan, go and tell my servant David, thus says the Lord, would you build me a house to dwell in? I have not lived in a house since the day I brought you people of Egypt, of Israel from Egypt to this day. But I've been moving about in a tent for my dwellings. In all my places, in all places where I have moved with all the people of Israel, did I speak a word with any of the judges of Israel? whom I commanded to shepherd my people Israel, saying, Why have you not built me a house of cedar? Now therefore, thus you shall say to my servant David, Thus says the Lord of hosts, I took you from the pasture, from following the sheep, that you should be prince over my people Israel. And we're going to take a break right there. We're going to dissect some of that. And so don't miss this. God gave rest to David, right, and his people after those battles. God gives us rest. Lean into that rest. Allow yourself to be refreshed, right? Some of us just go, 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 right? We need to slow down. We need to allow God's refreshment in our life. God purposely gives us refreshment. I need to hear that. If my wife is here, she's saying yes and amen, right? Because on Friday mornings or Fridays, I have my Sabbath, and I try to turn off my phone, and I try to shut it down. The, the, the church is very gracious to give us. They command us, actually. They say, we need to take a Sabbath. Um, but to shut it down on Fridays has been a challenge for me, just to be honest. But God gave him rest, and he gave the people rest. Secondly, take notice that King David has moved the Ark of the Covenant to the city of David, or Jerusalem, as we know it today. The Ark of the Covenant was a symbol of God's presence, it also held the Ten Commandments that had carved out, uh, that Moses had carved out when he was on the mountain with God. This was huge news for Israel. This was a very big deal. They had been given a righteous king in David, and now they had been given peace by God, and the very presence of God was dwelling in the city of David in Jerusalem. Let's camp out a little bit on the ark. What was the ark? And so the ark was a box, right? A wooden box plated in gold. It represented God's presence with his people. There was a mercy seat over the top of the covenant where God's throne was to be, and God's presence was above that. This was also the place where God met Moses and gave him commands in the book of Exodus. It was holy, incredibly holy. In fact, so holy, if you went into its presence, you would die. 
People actually died stepping into the presence of the ark because it was God's presence, right? And people are not clean, right? We're sinful and you cannot be in front of a holy God. And so as many as 70 people dropped at one time. 70 people because of God's presence there at the ark. Touching the ark resulted in immediate death. God gave the Israelites a lot of rules concerning the covenant, right? Because of this reason, it was kept in the most holy of holies. It was divided from the temple by a curtain, right? Or the tabernacle. It was divided by this curtain. It was in what was called the holy of holies, hidden from view by this curtain. Only the high priest could enter this most holy place, and he could only enter one time a year. And only after he went through ceremonial cleansing, God took this very seriously. And he went in there one day out of the year and he made sacrifices to atone for the sins and the nation's sins, his own and and Israel's sins. He went before the Lord. It was the most holy place. They did that on Yom Kippur, or if we hear the day of atonement in the Jewish tradition, that's what they're talking about. The day when the high priest would go in and he would... uh, Uh, sacrifice for the sins of God's people, right? For Israel and his own. He would walk into the Holy of Holies. The Ark of the Covenant has amazing visual imagery if we think about it, right? Everything about it points to Jesus if we think about it. Jesus had fulfilled the perfect requirement of God on our behalf. See, he was the once and all sacrifice. They didn't have to go in. The high priest doesn't have to go in once a year anymore and sacrifice for us. Jesus was that lasting sacrifice. When he went onto the cross for us, he was the once and for all sacrifice, right? But he was also the high priest. Jesus is our high priest. Jesus went in before us, right? Jesus went to the cross for us. He's the one that entered in, right? He took our sin, our shame, our guilt. He took it upon himself, and went to that cross on our behalf. He was the better and final high priest, right? He represents that high priest. It was pointing to Jesus, that final propitiation that happened on the cross for us. When Jesus was crucified, the scriptures tell us that the curtain that separated that most holy of holies was tore. It was torn in half when he died that day, right? Representing that now we have relationship with God, that we can enter into his very presence, right? We have that authority now because of what Christ has done for us. He has tore that veil. It is no longer a secret place. We get to go in. We're anointed by his Holy Spirit. His Spirit actually dwells within us. And now we get to be priests. You've probably heard us talk about the priesthood of all believers here at the church. All of us, because of what Jesus has done, who have trusted in that finished work on the cross have been ordained as priests. We have full access to him. We don't have to go through a priest, right? We can come right before the God of the universe, confess our sins and be forgiven, repent and to turn from our sins and turn back to God. We, we have the, the ability to enter into other people's lives, to minister to others. Every one of us are given that. We're the priests. Another thing I'd like to draw your attention to is that David was given Nathan. Did you guys catch that? I'm sure you did, right? God cares so much for us. He's given me, like I said, Casey and John. He given, he's given, at this point, Nathan, right? Nathan gets to enter into David's story, point him in the right direction, remind him of God's truth. God loved David so much that he gave him a friend, a prophet, somebody who were to speak God's words into his life. See, it wasn't God's, I mean, it wasn't David's tenacious warrior ability. It wasn't even his incredible leadership skills that made him such an awesome king. It was God. It was God using David, right? We see that. The scriptures are very clear in that direction. The Lord said, I have been with you wherever you have went, and I have cut off all your enemies from before you. God equipped David Lee certainly with the skill set and spiritual gifting to be an incredible warrior and king. But it was still God who did it all. He gets all the glory for that. He's the one that fought his battles. And God fights our battles. We are no different, right? God has anointed us and he fights our battles for us. The Lord says, I've been with you wherever you went and I've cut off your enemies. And he says that to us. It's the same thing he says to us. 
God is with you and I today. Do you believe that? You should. It'll change everything for you when you start believing that, as I said. Many of you desire to break free from sinful habits in your life, things that continue to own you. As I even say that, I bet some of you know what that sin is. What is the sin or unbelief that continues to own you, that continues to trip you up, right? God wants to free you from that. But many of us think that we can overcome it on our own. We think if I just try harder, I can overcome it. That is not true. God is the one that needs to overcome it. We need to faithfully allow him to do that work in us, right? So he gets all the glory, not us. So we'll pick up reading now in verses 10 through 17 of 2 Samuel 7. So it begins in uh, verse 10, And I will appoint a place for my people Israel, and I will plant them, so that they may dwell in their own place and be disturbed no more. And violent men shall afflict them no more as formerly, from the time that I appointed judges over my people Israel. And I will give you rest from all your enemies. Moreover, the Lord declares to you that the Lord will make you a house. When your days are fulfilled and you lie down with your fathers, I will raise up your offspring after you who will come from your body and I will establish his kingdom. He shall build a house for my name and I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. I will be to him a father and he shall be to me a son. When he commits iniquity, I will discipline him with the rod of men, with the stripes of the sons of man. But my steadfast love will not depart from him as I took it from Saul whom I put away from before you. It's talking about God's sovereignty here. He says, I will give you rest from your enemies. I am with you. I'm in charge of everything. Next, he speaks about Solomon, right? He's speaking about that David isn't to build him a house, but his son would, in fact, build this grand temple. And so Solomon stepped in and built this grand temple. But as we know Solomon's story, if any of you know anything about Solomon, he failed. He wasn't perfect. He couldn't be the substitute. That was not the lineage that would bring the Messiah, the true Messiah, the one and only Christ, right? It wasn't Solomon, but it came through his lineage, right? So we'll pick it up in 16 and 7. It says this, And your house and your kingdom shall be made sure forever before me. Your throne will be established forever in accordance with these words and in accordance with this vision Nathan spoke to David. God promised, this is the Christ connection, that every future king of Israel would come from David's family. And David's kingdom would last forever. God kept his promise by sending his son Jesus to be one of David's descendants. Jesus is our king who will rule over God's people forever. This is what we call the Davidic covenant. If we look at the lineage of Jesus in Matthew or Luke, it goes through the lineage of David. He fulfills that promise. This is God exercising his cosmic kingship. God is the king. Exodus 15, 18 says, the Lord will reign forever and ever. See, God is the king. In John chapter 1, it says this about Jesus. In the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through him, and without him was not things, without him was not anything made that was made. See, Jesus didn't just come into existence there in the manger, right? He'd always been sitting on the throne. He was always, he was part of creation. He placed Adam and Eve in the garden, right? This perfect garden where there was no anxiety, no fear, no struggle, no cancer, no criticism, a perfect garden. He placed them there. But that perfect shalom peace was quickly snapped when they chose to disobey and eat of that fruit, When they chose to disobey, the cosmos were fractured, it says. Sin entered into humanity and immediately shalom peace was gone. That we have inherited that same sin, right? Because of that sin of Adam and Eve, we inherited sin. And because God is holy and righteous and just, he has to punish our sin and that punishment is death. Every one of us are going to die. Eternally we're born. Yeah, I mean, physically we're born and physically we'll die. One day we're going to die, right? Eternally, we're going to spend eternity away from God if he doesn't intervene on our behalf. We're going to spend an eternity of death. And spiritually, we're all born dead. We come into this world spiritually dead. 
no amount of good works will do. Really, really bad news, right? And our, we can do nothing about it. But thank God that God made a way, right? I was recently watching a Tim Keller sermon, and Tim Keller was talking about Christ and him leaving his throne, dethroning himself and coming into human history, right? God, had, God was rich. Jesus was rich, unfathomably rich, he says. He owned everything. He sat on his throne, but there's one thing he didn't have. You know what he didn't have? Us, right? He had to dethrone himself. He had to leave heaven and come to earth if he were to have a relationship with us. He had to be dethroned. Jesus made his, us, you and I, his greatest treasure. He left all of heaven for you and I. That's mucho love, right? That's God's love for us. He gave it all up for you and I. And I think the proper response is make him our greatest treasure, right? As we make him our greatest treasure, he made us his. He gave it all for us. He lived the sinless life, the life that we could not live, sinless in every way, tempted as we were, went to a cross on our behalf. He was crucified, overcoming our sin and our death, our two greatest enemies on that cross on our behalf overcoming sin and death for us, was buried in a tomb and arose in three days. Our sin problem and our death problem had been taken care of. He has now anointed us with his Holy Spirit because of it. We are God's anointed ones. So Jesus is the perfect final high priest. Jesus is the perfect final sacrifice. He is the once and all sacrifice for all sins. Jesus is the better and final king. His rule and reign is forever. He is our king and we have been ransomed and rescued by him. Jesus has changed everything for us. But I see many of you live in stagnant lives. I see a ton of transformation, but I see a ton of people being stagnant, right? And not necessarily even here. I think just God's people living in stagnant lives, not allowing the freedom that he wants for us to partake in in our lives. Please don't understand me. Struggle and suffering are part of the deal. We're always going to struggle. But I think as we give ourselves to the Lord, as we allow him to work in our lives, he transforms and he changes us. He wants something so much greater. See, many of us don't make time for God. We continue to make excuses, make conscious decisions to do other things, not willing to get up early to spend time with the king of the universe, to be in his very presence, to worship him, choose sporting events, children's activities rather than attending Sunday service. Please, this is not me coming after anybody, right? But we got to look at what we choose in this life. Is Christ everything? in our lives. We need to examine our lives in that way. Right? He wants that freedom for you. We keep going back to Egypt. He's brought us out of Egypt. He's brought us in the promised land and we continue to return. We choose Egypt. We say it's easier if I just go back to my addiction or my impatience or my anger. Fill in the blank for whatever it is for you. We always go back Let's stop going back. Let's look forward. Let's allow Jesus to draw us in sanctification, to look more like him, to grow in our knowledge of Jesus. We need to be in our words. We need to be in relationship with other believers. We need to allow people to speak truths in our lives. One of the things I did is on the backside of your bulletin, there's something called the DNA. We do these here at the church. This is one really practical way that if you're going to read scriptures to apply and to look for Jesus right? Check this out. Ask those questions on the back. Who is God when you're reading scripture? What has he done specifically through the work of Jesus in the midst of this scripture? What's my identity because of it? And how am I called to live? It speaks to all those things. And when we know these things, they change us, right? As I get up early to just be in God's presence, I get up extra early every morning. And this is not to toot my horn. It's because I love Jesus. 
I love getting up early. I love being in his presence. A couple hours before anybody gets up in my house, I'm worshiping, I'm praying, I'm usually crying, I'm reading scriptures, right? I want to draw into his presence. I need his power to get through my day. Does that mean that my life is without trouble? Absolutely not. I've never experienced so much joy in all of my life as the season I'm in right now, in freedom. But my marriage is still hard, right? My marriage is still difficult, right? I still get angry. I say things I wish I wouldn't have. I did it this morning. I did it last night. And I'll do it probably this afternoon, right? I got to ask my wife for forgiveness, my son for forgiveness. What if you committed to change? What if you actually made time for God? Right? So one of the things on the back of that sheet, it kind of leads you through, uh, as we enter into one another's lives, are these questions is, where is the Spirit leading you? Where is he showing you uh, sin and unbelief in your life, right? We need to be honest about the unbelief in our life. All sin is rooted in a lie, right? And so we need to be honest of where we're believing these lies and apply the gospel to it. But oftentimes we miss it, right? We need other people to apply that gospel to our lives. We need people to speak truths in our lives, remind us who we are in Christ, reorient our hearts so we can walk forth in joy and freedom, even in the midst of adversity and pain and suffering. Check that out. If you have any questions, come to the connection table and we can walk you through some of that. So I'm going to start laying in the plane here. I know the team's up behind me. If they just give me just a couple more minutes. And so before we do, I just want to remind you what's been done for you and who he is, right? God is in control, right? You don't have to fear. You don't have to worry. God is in control. He has everything in control, right? Right? And what's the proof that God is in control? Jesus, right? If there was ever a day it looked like he was out of control, it was that day on the cross when Jesus was being crucified. The Messiah of the world was dying. And yet even death had to answer to God, right? God is in control. If he was in control of that moment, I promise you he's in the control of your moment now, right? We got to place that type of truths in our lives. We got to allow other people to place those type of truths in our lives. And so as I land the plane, we want to talk, we talked today about anointing. We've been anointed. Let that change you and transform you. You've been called by the God of the universe. He set good works before you. Step into that. Lean into that. Promises. He has promised truths in your life. Allow those promises to come true. Allow others to speak truth in your life, to walk alongside you, for his very spirit that dwells within you to lead and guide you to draw you into repentance, to turn from those sinful things that you do and the unbelief that lies at your heart and turn back to Jesus, right? Repentance. David Nicholas, who founded Spanish River Church and the reason why we exist said this, when you know how much God loves you, then you trust him and when you trust him, you will obey him. And I'm gonna leave you with this story. There's a story about a young missionary about 24 years old Anybody who's been around me in the last month or two has heard this story, and I apologize if you've heard it, but it's had profound effect on me, and I think it will on you as well. This gentleman's name is Adarin Judson. He was sent to Burma, steadfast on bringing the gospel to the Burmese people, deep conviction to engage those people for Christ. For 38 years, he was in Burma, greatly tested and tried, right? Right? persecution, risk of imprisonment. imprisonment. Two of his wives passed away in the midst of his ministry. Thirteen of his, seven of his 13 children died while he was there, and yet he continually, faithfully walked forward to bring the gospel to Burma, right? Ultimately, a terrible sickness at sea took his own life. He not only finished a Burmese English dictionary, but he also translated the New Testament into Burmese. After 10 years, he had 18 believers in his church. 18. By worldly standards, that is a failure. But he continued, and he wasn't, he, and he was joyful in the midst of it. If anybody has read about this guy, he was joyful in the midst of all this pain and tragedy. Nevertheless, he continued to persevere, and today there's 4 million Burmese Christians, it's now a different country, that have come to know Jesus because this man's conviction to continue to press on when mission was hard. He knew what the presence of the Lord was and he allowed it to empower him for mission. Would you do the same? So we're going to take 
communion now. I'm going to ask the elders to come up here in just a minute. But I just want to say this, that uh, if, if you feel like God is drawing you, right, there's a response that God's re- drawing you into now. It's different for all of us. But I believe that God is drawing some of you into a relationship with him. And so I pray that you would receive Christ today. There are going to be prayer partners up here in a minute that will walk you through that, will pray with you through that. Elders, if you would come up front. And the last scripture I just share with you, for those of you that maybe think you're being drawn, and I think there are some in here being drawn to know Jesus, to trust him as your Lord and Savior. This is one of the last scriptures in all of the Bible. I, Jesus, have sent my angel to testify to you about these things for the churches. I am the root and the descendant of David, the bright morning star. The spirit and the bride says, come and let the one who hears say, come and let the one who is thirsty come. Let the one who desires take the water of life without price. All right. And so now we're going to jump into a time of communion. So I don't know what your response is, but this is just a beautiful opportunity to respond to the message of Christ, his anointing, his calling, his promises on your life, his presence, right? We're going to have prayer partners up front. We're going to all come up. We're going to partake in communion together. The elders, uh, we miss Matt, and I'll come up in just a second. And so this is a spiritual nourishment for us. The invitation is for everyone who has called Jesus their Lord. If you're not a believer today, we would ask that you not partake, that you would sit. But for those that have been called to Christ, come forward. But I would say this, the scripture is very clear, that if you're struggling with a sin in your life, if you've made peace with some area of sin in your life, that you would stay in your seat, that you would wrestle with God, that maybe you wouldn't partake today. What is it that keeps tripping you up? Wrestle with God for a minute. And then we'll all come up. You'll take the elements, you go back to your seats, and we'll take them together. The beautiful part about that is it signals our unity together, right? I had a really awesome example of how the communion is the parallel to the Passover. I don't have time to do that. But if you would read the Passover in the Old Testament, this is a beautiful, beautiful example, right? Pointing towards, right, the ultimate Lord's Supper. And so if you would all, you can come forth and grab your elements. I'll lead us through here. As we partake uh, in the juice, in the bread that represents God's blood and body broken and poured out for us. For I received from the Lord what I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus on the night he was betrayed took the bread And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, take this. This is my body in remembrance of me. Go ahead and partake. So he took the cup after supper, saying, this cup is a new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Drink. I'm going to give you a prayer a benediction actually we're going to have prayer partners if you would come up please if you desire prayer we ask that you would come up we have prayer partners for you I apologize for going late I'll give you a benediction and we'll send you on your way if you want to receive this benediction go ahead and hold out your hands may the God our Father and Lord Jesus Christ continue to bless you and keep you and bless your families in rich and beautiful ways may his presence empower you to live a life of greater joy and peace as his spirit leads and directs you today and forevermore. Go in peace. Love you all.